joining me again. My name's Christopher Snowden. This is the Swift Half with Snowden. Uh, it's a uh, irregular podcast in which I talk to uh, somebody that I know, someone I'd like to get to know better, somebody I think you should know. And I'm very pleased in this episode to welcome Sam Bowman. Sam is best known as the inventor of the Bowman salad, but uh, what a lot of people don't know is he's also an economist and a revered Twitter personality. Sam, welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going? I'm very well, thank you. Very well, yeah. Um, I'm uh, enjoying the sun. I moved into a flat that only has electric heating, which costs literally hundreds of pounds to heat. So um, we all live in absolute freezing conditions um, until it's sunny, and it's sunny today, so I'm warm and happy. Yeah, you've got lots of glass there to give you the greenhouse effect. It's especially good for um, when I come home in a drunken stupor and I want to cause serious injury to myself by running through a glass door. I will always have the option of doing that. Well, yeah, because they're, they're so clean. Now, Sam, you started as a libertarian at the Adam Smith Institute, um, the UK's second best think tank, and you then became a neoliberal and you converted most of the people at the Adam Smith Institute to neoliberalism. Then you left the Adam Smith Institute and became a COVID bedwetter and lockdown fascist. It's a fascinating journey. Talk me through it. Well, I think I've always been, um, I've always had the makings of being a lockdown fascist. And um, I think properly understood all neoliberals, at least, should be lockdown fascists. Um, It's part of our DNA. But um, really what I have always thought is that the purpose of government and the purpose of pretty much everything is to make people's lives better in the kind of broader sense. Um, Really what I mean by making people's lives better is let people do what they want. And a big component of doing what you want is not being dead. Um, So I think um, where government has a role and and incidentally, my understanding of the way government makes people's lives better is to not do very much. Uh, I do think it's good for government to take some money from rich people and give it to poor people. But generally, I think they shouldn't regulate markets very heavily because when they do, they make us poorer. And generally, I think almost always, in fact, they should let people kind of do with their own bodies what they want. And it's only when you doing something with your own body affects my ability to do something with my own body that there is a role for government. So usually that's, you know, we can talk about that when it comes to pollution, talk about that when it comes to noise, you know, noisy neighbors, I think there potentially is a role for probably not government, but some kind of institution to um, adjudicate disputes like that. But when it comes to deadly diseases, um, I think it's often um, very important for government to step in and protect us from each other. When it comes to COVID, and we can talk about this later, I think a lot of people have underestimated how dangerous COVID is, how dangerous COVID is and how harmful it is. And so a lot of people kind of took the view that the best thing to do was to just let COVID rip. And, you know, it's not good, but, you know, we have bad flus very frequently and life is life, people will die, yada, yada. My view was always that COVID was actually very bad. I always took the kind of view that um, along with kind of Neil Ferguson and other um, people who I think have been proved right, but kind of early on were warning that COVID was going to be really bad. You know, we're talking like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people dead in the UK and not just really old people. And I thought that given that, it was really important that the government did as much as it could, as early as it could, to protect us from other people carrying COVID who might give it to us. So I thought the best thing to do, um, and, and I think with hindsight, almost everybody, unless you're really crazy, would agree that the best thing to have done would have been the kind of earliest lockdown possible, which would be closing the borders. Um, the country that's had the best COVID experience of any country in the world was Taiwan, which closed its borders before pretty much <clears throat> the, the, the disease could take root. So. I would say, if you don't agree that, then I, you know, we're, we're, we almost have different conceptions of what's good in the world. So we, we, all, we all have a baseline where we agree that the best outcome came from a really early lockdown, which is, which is one where you only have to lock down the airports. The second best experience from, through COVID, I would say was New Zealand, which did the next best thing, which is a lockdown after it's moved into the country, but early enough that it hasn't spread around very much. And since then, they've really had almost complete normality. And I would say the third best country in terms of its COVID experience was Australia, which had to do an incredibly brutal lockdown in some parts of the country, in Victoria and some other parts, for months and months and months, where people could barely leave their own homes. But 
they eliminated the disease domestically. They kept the borders sealed. And they've, you know, my Instagram is filled with Australians I know having parties and hanging out with each other. And it has been for months. I think you would be very strange if you disagreed with any of those points. So if you agree with me that the most successful countries are the ones that have had swift, early and effective lockdowns, then the only question is, once we fail to do lockdown early on, what should we do later on? Is there a point where it's too late to do a lockdown and then we um, have to we have to basically just let hundreds of thousands of people die. That's something that I think is an open question. I'm pretty convinced that it's right to still do, it was right to still do lockdowns after um, you know the, the initial point had passed, but I think intelligent people can disagree on that. Um, but to me, the one baseline that we should all establish is lockdown fascism gave Taiwan, Australia, and New Zealand the best possible 2020 of any country in the world. So lockdown fascism, as we're defining it, worked amazingly well. The only problem was that the rest of us didn't do it early enough. I suppose the argument against that would be that you kind of, it's hindsight bias, right? The historian's fallacy. You can say that because then we got the vaccine way quicker than anybody thought we would. And if in fact it had taken years to get a vaccine, then either we'd be living in sort of miserable isolation or more likely being that we're in the UK rather than New Zealand, the virus would keep getting in and we'd have to keep locking down again and again. I mean, that, that, that's the, I mean, you're right in, in retrospect. Um, what I don't understand though is the people who, now that we've got the vaccine, still effectively wanted to let it rip in January. And yeah. I, go on. Well, I, I mean, I think there are two um, points there. The first is I don't think, um, everybody, I don't think the vaccine came as a total surprise. And um, the evidence for that is that loads and loads of different kinds of vaccines work really well. You know, um, I'm in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine trial. Um, I would be completely happy to get an mRNA. I'd be completely happy to get an AstraZeneca. I'd be completely happy to get the Novavax vaccine, all of which use different technologies, different kinds of ways of solving this. So it's not like we just sort of magically stumbled upon some magic bullet. Um, mRNA vaccines miraculously have turned out to be this incredible solution to this problem, which maybe is a bit like a magic bullet. But even if those didn't exist, we'd still have vaccines based on fairly old, fairly kind of tried and tested technology, the J&J &J vaccine, the um, AstraZeneca vaccine. So I think maybe people who are unaware of vaccines maybe were justified in kind of in ignorance in not realizing that a vaccine was was coming. But I was pretty confident of the vaccine coming last year. Most people I know were pretty confident of the vaccine coming last year. And I think um, if you based your opposition to lockdown on the idea that a vaccine wasn't likely, that's on you. That's a mistake you've made, not, not you specifically. Well, the but... World Health Organization said it was going to be at least spring 2021 before one well, was even yet another reason. Yet another reason to never listen to the World Health Organization. Yeah, you're, don't you're have travel bans, don't wear face masks, and don't count on there being a vaccine anytime soon. And, and the biggest threat to public health is hamburgers and alcohol, right? right? It's, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know that I would ever put much stock in what they say. Um, on, the second, on the second point, um, the, <clears throat> the people who want to let it rip now, um, I think are a combination of people who called it really badly and are kind of trying to save face, or at least like they can't really accept that they got it really, really catastrophically wrong. And a combination, and people who are kind of demented, basically people who, you know, the film Contagion, um, which is, you know, this Steven Soderbergh movie that I guess everybody's rewatched, um, predicts really well that in any kind of massive crisis, you're going to get loonies who um, maybe believe what they're saying. I'm, I don't, you know, know that. I think some, you know, I think some people are kind of charlatans and are basically lying and bullshitting and taking advantage of sort of naive people who trust them. Um, but I think. Most of the kind of leading um, people who still want to let it rip are true believers who uh, just, you know, they can't, they can't combine facts in their head. You know, they, they, they can't weigh, for example, you know, let's say there's a one in 10 million chance of dying of a blood clot or getting a blood clot from a vaccine. And that may, you know, I don't know if that's accurate, but let's just say that that's the number. A lot of people find it really difficult to weigh that tiny risk against the massive risk of getting COVID. And, you know, we, we saw this as, uh, in fact, some people's criticisms of New Zealand, um, or some people who couldn't really accept that lockdown worked so well in New Zealand, 
would say, aha, look, New Zealand is going to lockdown again. Ah, look, you see, they, they too have to do lockdowns. Un, you know, seemingly kind of unable to realize that three months of lockdown in the UK versus three days of lockdown in New Zealand are not really the same. And um, there are differences in degree and magnitude of harm. Um, and I think a lot of people just kind of struggle to, um, a lot of the leading people who criticize uh, or, or who kind of still stick to the kind of wanting to let it rip approach haven't really been able to weigh those two different um, magnitudes of harm. Did you see, I can't remember which medical group it was, or maybe it was a few of them this week, had to put out a, a message to women saying, don't stop taking the contraceptive pill. You know, you might get pregnant, that's a bad thing. All because in order to try and put the risk of blood clots into perspective, there was this big push on saying, actually the contraceptive pill is like 10 times worse. And so instead of people picking up the, you know, taking the vaccine, they stopped taking the contraceptive pill. Like, oh, what a tangled web we weave when we try and put relative risk into context. Yeah. I didn't see that, but um, I do think like, this is a great meme. You know, the more, the more people uh, who think I take this risk into my, into my life, into my hands every single day, um, like I, I'm definitely going to take the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine because the contraceptive pill is clearly very sexist um, because of the blood clot risk. I thought, oh, that's great. And also, actually, although I'm not one of them, <clears throat> I uh, was pleased to see that some of the socially conservative friends I have who um, think the contraceptive pill is bad, I was happy for them that they saw uh, some people uh, less inclined to take the contraceptive pill. Although. Uh, I think ultimately, hopefully nobody <clears throat> doesn't take it because of uh, a, a very, I think, uh, tiny, tiny, tiny risk, I assume. Now, you made the point about welfare economics uh, to begin with there. I mean, you sort of resigned from the Libertarian Club. I seem to have been kicked out for supporting this lockdown. And like you, I always <laughs> kind of thought that libertarianism was basically just applied economics. You know, I'm not interested in libertarian as a, as a faith. I'm interested in doing the best thing that produces the best outcomes. And if libertarianism you know, fails to produce the best outcomes, I think it's something that we should, we should question. But I've noticed a lot of people who kind of self-describe as libertarians or even as Austrians or whatever, uh, there's been a real absence of economic thinking, fairly basic economic thinking during the pandemic from a lot of people. Things like negative externalities, collective action mm -hmm. problems, fairly basic concepts. Yeah. Even just basic welfare economics seem to have been um, missing. And we've had, for example, people, not, not, you know, not big statists, not Marxists, but, you know, fairly, you know, people I thought were reasonably reliable, saying we need to have a tax on people working from home in order to keep the sandwich shops mm. going in central London. I mean, just recently, maybe slightly different people, but it's actually the Conservative Party saying we need to legislate to stop this football mm. Super League happening. Yeah. Um, I guess this kind of economic ignorance has always been with us, but it really seems to come to the fore in the last 18 months. I, I, I actually would characterize it as, and, and by the way, one exception to what you've talked about is um, a new book called Economics in One Virus by Ryan Bourne. Um, which, which is very good. I've just read it. Yeah, yeah. Which, uses, which uses the pandemic to illustrate loads of really important ideas in economics um, and, and is really good. But the way I see it is less a lack of economic thinking and more a lack of model-based thinking. So it's less that people um, don't get economics because I think a lot of the people who propose things like taxes on working from home do understand economics. They just don't have a kind of coherent model of how the world works that, that where you know point A interacts with point B in a coherent way. And I think that um, very, very many people, particularly in um, kind of public facing and prominent jobs, end up with a kind of grab bag of sort of random beliefs that, um, you know, Christian Nemitz would probably say the beliefs are fashionable or they get kind of social reward for having them. Um, I might say that it's because, you know, they're, they're less interested in how these things interact with each other and less interested in, you know, if, if, if this is true here, then what does that mean for, for over here? And more kind of interested in a sort of you know, pragmatic, they might think, um, approach to these questions. But I think it's been really, you know, I mean, for me, uh, an example was the competition of markets authority um, saying it was going to kind of stamp down on price gouging and um, warning uh, retailers that raised prices for really high demand things, you know, like rice, flour, uh, face masks, hand sanitizer at the beginning of the pandemic, that they could be breaking the law because they could be price gouging. And, you know, these guys clearly certainly understand economics. I think there's zero question that there are, you know, a lot of brilliant economists at that, um, at that agency. 
but I don't know that they had considered in a kind of in a sort of well developed way. You know, what are the knock on effects of preventing price gouging? You know, okay, sure, you certainly have lower prices for the pieces of you know the bits of rice, the bags of flour, or whatever, the face masks that that exist. But you're not thinking about the kind of second order effects of preventing the price from rising, which if you allowed the price to rise, you would create a huge incentive for basically middlemen to come in, find face masks. Maybe, you know, we should talk about flour and rice because face masks probably should have been going to public health workers then, but, you know, hand sanitizer, yada, yada. You cause people who maybe are stockpiling or people who don't need that much rice to stop buying every, you know, grain of rice they find in the shop and to and to kind of limit their consumption. And um, you, you kind of have a sort of balancing force that the uh, equilibrium that um, most economists kind of tend to think happens in most markets um, that are reasonably competitive. And, you know, the people who condemned price gouging in this case, I think understand equilibrium and understand economics, but didn't apply that kind of second order thinking to this, this case. They were just interested in, you know, we have a role here to prevent, you know, I guess, some exploitative behavior by retailers and the result was we had empty shelves we had shortages and we had probably less of this stuff being produced and and supplied to people than we could have had um yeah. and well, perhaps a sort of more that's inefficient incredibly predictable of it. isn't it i think you're being too kind to them i mean i would think price gouging it's you don't even need to apply economic things to that it's like literally in the economic textbooks isn't it saying you know if you it, restrict the the price yeah. then you will end up with some people hoarding and over purchasing and other people having nothing even if even if you ignore the kind of what happens afterwards and the disincentives to create more it's but obvious that's the, but that, well i i think it's obvious but um the question then is why do people who understand that and certainly you know if you put a gun to their head and you said like what does a what does an economics textbook tell you about price catching laws uh, in an emergency they would definitely give you you know they're not unaware of this i think the problem is a reluctance or a um they don't want to apply and i don't think it's i i basically just think they 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 don't have a kind of consistent model of how the world works i think they they think okay in this situation there are loads of exceptions and we can we can think of loads of ad hoc exceptions you know maybe we think the supply of these things in the short run is really really um inflexible maybe so so, so you know higher prices don't mean more supply let's say uh, maybe we think that rich people are going to stockpile these things and poor people are not going to be able to get them. There are all sorts of kind of ad hoc sort of exceptions you can think of and you can apply. And maybe some of them are true. But there comes a point where the balance between the model and the kind of ad hoc exceptions shifts in favor of the ad hoc exceptions. And you end up with, um, I think, just kind of random policy making where there's basically no connection between um, things like economics and what you're doing in the real world at all. And you can, you almost get kind of captured by fads and random ideas mm. like taxing people for working from home and yada, yeah. yada. I think I Andy Haldane is a, is a real master of this. I think he's the kind of ultimate non-model based thinker um, <laughs> because I'm sure he's a smart guy, but he seems to just come out with ideas based on like a, an interesting kind of poem he's read or like a, you just, just sort of almost complete, <laughs> almost a total random. And um, you know, to me, this is uh, to me, it's a really um, visible thing in public policy. The, the Super League is an example, although I think that some people have made arguments that I don't find convincing, but are at least kind of coherent. Like they're not they're not just sort of totally random. Um, well, what's the best about... argument for? It? I was asking on Twitter earlier. What's is there any even vaguely liberal justification <clears throat> for the government legislating to stop the super league i didn't see any sensible suggestions i can't actually think of anything from any normal political ideology i can't think of any good conservative ones either i can't think of anything that's like not dictatorial <laughs> that could justify it but i bet you've got a few troll ones at least i mean what's the what's the best argument for the government trying to ban the super league i don't think government should ban the super league but the two best arguments are um number one that what, what is going on is a shift from UK fans to fans in other countries. And, um, you know, fans in other countries want to watch Ronaldo and Messi playing for Juventus and Barcelona every week. And they, they basically just don't care about the kind of smaller teams. They just want to see those again and again. And those people now have more money. And so um, that's kind of the motivation for all this. And 
the argument is that governments in the UK don't have a responsibility to those people abroad. They only have a responsibility to people in the UK. And um, so basically what they're doing is they're saying, no, you may not serve these people in China and India who want to see these games. You must instead serve these people in the UK who like you playing the lower league. Um, I don't find that super convincing because money is the kind of, <clears throat> usually money is the force that allows us to weigh up competing kind of uh, costs and benefits. And remember that the clubs will get money from these people. So it's not like they're just giving away games for free to people in China and India. They're, they're, asked, they're giving them away for money, which comes into the UK and allows people in the UK and these clubs to import things from abroad and so on. So in the same way that trade is good, um, you know, this is good. Second argument is to do with um, like thinking about um, the, the football leagues as like a network. Um, where the value of the network for everybody is bigger, the more and the higher quality of the members of the network. So these really good clubs at the beginning, at the top, have benefited massively from their membership of this network and from the fact that they've had years and you know centuries now of or, or decades of playing these lower league clubs. And now they're really big and they have this international audience they're leaving in a way that reduces the value of all the other clubs, reduces the kind of network because, you know, who the hell wants to watch Burnley play Sheffield United every week if there's no prospect of them playing Liverpool sometimes. Um, and in doing that, they're kind of free riding on historical kind of network benefits. Again, I don't think that's that a good an argument. I'm it's just a bit sort of tenuous, but at least it's coherent. I mean, they're two coherent reasons. Like they kind of, I don't agree with mine, <laughs> but at least it kind of makes sense. Let's talk about the economy. Now, I think that we're in for quite a bit of inflation i think that every like traditional economic indicator suggests that we are in not not weimar republic not even hyperinflation or not even double digits but quite a bit say four or five percent inflation loads of people have got enormous amount of money to spend they're going to go out and spend it there is probably a shortage of things it's a classic example too much money chasing too few goods and governments around the world have been printing it like it's going out of fashion i don't think you agree with that but why not or do well, you, maybe since we last spoke? Um, I, I don't think that we're going to see something like runaway inflation. Um, and the reason I, I, I don't think that is that we can look at what markets expect by looking at the difference between inflation-linked bonds and non-inflation-linked bonds. And the difference, we would assume, is what financial markets expect inflation to look like in the future. So basically, they do the work for us. And people whose full-time job it is to look at the kinds of factors you're talking about Basically, they make money or lose money on the basis of how accurate their predictions are. So I just outsource my opinions to them. They're historically very accurate. They don't think that there's massive inflation coming down. I think a different question that is also worth thinking about is, do we want lots of inflation? And um, it might be surprising, but I think, yes, to some extent, we do want a lot of inflation, not runaway inflation. But one of the big problems that we've had since pretty much the financial crisis is that central banks have been really, really reluctant to, and central banks are the institutions that determine it more or less in the kind of long run at least, or the medium run, what the inflation rate is. And they've been really reluctant to allow too much inflation, but they've been very, very re reluctant to, uh, they've been very, very happy to allow too little inflation, which is, which is not really what their job is. Their job is to be sort of neutral as to whether you have too much or too little and to focus on that too Well, about interest rates about as low as they could possibly go. There's not a lot more they could do to get inflation going, is it? They can do quantitative easing. More, so more, I, I, more, yeah, they've done quite a bit of that as well. Well, you know, Milton Friedman once said using interest rates to um, determine the inflation rate is a bit like trying to determine the output of cars by manipulating the price of steel. Um, you know, it, it's a it's a very, very roundabout and not not necessarily that effective way of um, controlling the inflation rate, but but printing money. And as long as you get bonds in return that allow that you can sell back and forth so you can control the actual amount of money in the economy is a way of pretty surefire way of um, creating inflation if you need to. Now, the reason I think that we might want more inflation is that most of us have our rental contracts, our mortgages, our wage contracts, all of these um, contracts that govern our lives and, and are basically govern the entire economy are very rarely set in real terms. They're usually set in nominal terms. So they're usually um, blind to inflation. Um, so what you end up with can be a situation where we expect more inflation in the future than we actually get. So we end up with a kind of musical chair situation where we've set contracts 
expecting 2% inflation for the next 10 years, but only getting, let's say, 1% inflation for the next 10 years. So there's like a there's not enough money to go around in the economy to satisfy all these sort of wage contracts and mortgage contracts and all this. Um, and according to Milton Friedman and according to F.A. Hayek, one of the big reasons that you get such a huge downturns after um, what can begin as quite small co contractions in the economy is because this sort of musical chairs effect means that loads of people have to be laid off, loads of businesses go broke, you know, loads of people have to default on their debts or their mortgages and things like that. Not because they don't have the real resources, but because the nominal, the, the kind of amount of money circulating in the economy just can't satisfy all of those contracts. They, there's a kind of a shortfall in how much money there is compared to how much money people expected there to be. So it could be that, um, and I, I think there's some evidence for this, that after the 2008 recession, a lot of the kind of long period of slow growth that the Western world experienced was this sort of musical chairs problem where there just wasn't enough money, just, just paper bills and things like that floating around in the economy and, di and digital money and stuff like that floating around. And I, I think it's possible that we might see the same thing after this crisis. The reason I'm optimistic is that the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jay Powell, I think totally gets what I've said, and he is the ultimate model-based thinker. So um, I'm pretty optimistic that he's going to do the right thing. But back in 2008, that the money that was printed basically went to the banks, it went to their, their balance sheets. Whereas this time, the money actually has got to people. This, they haven't been able to spend it yet. So that in a couple of months' time, there's going to be masses of actual money floating around the system. Then the inflation goes up, and then people's ex expectation of inflation changes. This is how you do get runaway in in inflation, because people are going, right, it's 5% now, we're going to expect it to be 7% next year, and so on. And I don't think it will go up you know, kind of exponentially, but I think it could go up quite a bit. And it's not a great thing to have inflation at 4 or 5% if interest rates remain low, it eats away people's savings. And if interest rates go up in response to higher inflation, which has traditionally been what, what's happened, then suddenly all this cheap money we've been borrowing doesn't look so cheap anymore. Well, we can maybe disagree about the <clears throat> likelihood of that, but on the point about savings, um, it doesn't eat away at your savings if you're saving in the, in the right way. Um, nobody should be keeping large amounts of money in cash. Cash is a terrible, terrible, terrible way of saving money um, because even in normal times, you're not only losing 2% 2 every year to inflation, and that's just normal. That's the job of the Bank of England is to make sure everybody's cash loses 2% in value every year. But you're also losing things that you could have done with the money if you had put that money to productive uses. So it's really important that people don't save their money in cash unless, you know, except for kind of short term, you know, I've just got to pay rent, got to pay my bills kind of thing. And most of their money goes into things like index funds, where you kind of buy a whole share of the market and you're investing. Um, and if you invest your money, if you put your money into relatively safe, you know, trackers, I prefer global trackers where you're investing in the global market. Uh, I wouldn't put it into the UK market personally, but some people want to do that. If you do that, then inflation works for you because the value of those investments rises just like, sorry, the price of those investments, not the value, but the price of those investments rises in line with all the other inflation in the economy as well. So you can inflation proof your saving. Um, so I think that the number one, if we're worried about what you just said, the number one thing we should be doing is number one, encouraging people to save <clears throat> into index funds. And number two, re removing barriers like taxation on those kinds of savings that prevent them from doing so. You see, that just shows how long interest rates have been really low. I mean, you were basically a teenager, I think, when they were at a normal level. And it, it's not true that you didn't used to be able to save money in the bank. ISIS in particular gave you a great rate of return. ISIS now give you like 1%. Government Less, bonds give, they give you... you the ISIS give you like, a, you know, point, point right. naught five percent well, it, yeah. it used to be 6% at a time when inflation was 2 or 3%. You know, people used to be able to put their money in the, in the bank for decades and expect it to make a return. It wasn't the best way of getting a return. Um, but there was no risk to it. You know, now these days you have to assume some level of risk, whether it's a stock market or, um, you know, in investments or, or, or what have you. And as we've seen over the course of the last year, these share prices can, can go down as well. We've only got one minute left. Um, tell us quickly about the uh, the COVID FAQ that you'd be, you, uh, you were in The Guardian. You're a big friend of The Guardian now, as well as being a, a lockdown fascist. Um, well, tell us about I'm that website. The COVID FAQ is a website that I and a bunch of other people from all sorts of walks of life, some economists, some um, geneticists, psychologists, journalists, 
uh, put together that first of all tries to um, answer a lot of concerns and questions and what I would say are misinformations about COVID. Um, you know, some examples include the idea that vaccines are rushed and might be unsafe, which isn't the case. Um, the idea that masks deprive you of oxygen and endanger you, which isn't the case. Um, we don't ask you to take us on trust. We give you peer reviewed research um, as much as we can when we are giving you preprint, which is not yet peer reviewed research. We're making that clear. And whenever we change the site, we make it clear that we've changed it. Um, the hope is to sort of address a lot of um, questions that people have. The second part of the site is to highlight the track records of some people who we call COVID skeptics who have either downplayed COVID or, um, you know, made again and again and again kind of mistakes about COVID that really, really, you know, they should know better about and to highlight the kind of things that they were saying when the available evidence contradicted that and I would say made them very, very silly at the time. So we're not trying to be vindictive. We're not trying to, you know, catch people out for saying something that was, you know, possible to believe at the time, but that later turned out to be wrong. Everybody does that. Everybody's done that. We're just trying to highlight that some of the people who've become really prominent during the COVID um, kind of period that we've lived through have been um, saying things that were very, very, very silly at the time that a lot of people took them on trust about. And uh, we're just about, to, we're just here to say, read for yourself what they've said and you may trust them less. It's a valuable resource. It doesn't seem to be working though, I have to say. It seems like the, the number of so-called skeptics is spreading exponentially. I, I totally I, disagree. I think that they're really? like, I think they're like my time, running right? away from a light being switched off. Almost everybody I know who once opposed the approach of trying to keep the virus at bay, <clears throat> you know, we can disagree. I know you and I have disagreed about, you know, when was it appropriate to do lockdowns? What kinds of restrictions are appropriate? That's, you know, who, I'm totally open to those disagreements and they're really important disagreements to have. But the people who wanted to let it rip and let it kill, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, more than in fact than even died are i think really now tiny in number and the, the the more kind of obvious it becomes that they were wrong which since the vaccines i think has been indisputable um the more they have been trying to cover for themselves and trying to kind of create loads of like weird really kind of bullshitty sort of claims like oh wow it turns out lockdowns don't work uh, that huge decline in case numbers that you see the day we, we impose lockdowns in every country oh that's seasonality that's just because people happen to have it's decided just to, yeah. so it's just a coincidence all this stuff is like panicked people getting even more worried and worked up because they know that they look stupid almost everybody realizes they look stupid and um to me the kind of the net has closed in on them um really really significantly and they're, they're, they're loud but there is a very very kind of small number of them left well you say that i've blocked 1500 of them in the last six months and i don't even feel like i've touched the sides anyway sam thanks very much for coming on the show great to speak to you as always take thanks. care uh thank you at home for watching i'll be back again in a couple of weeks with somebody else don't know who yet um, but uh, enjoy the rest of your day. If you want to donate to the IA, please do so. Go to our website and give us some cash. Uh, and until next time, goodbye.